aspects of um, entering into a solar lease. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you guys for coming out today and hopefully everybody can hear me. So remember that none of this is legal advice as we still get going. If you think it's legal advice, shame on you. So let's do a little bit of an overview on this. And Sebastian's kind of laid out the economic issues with it. And I'm going to talk a lot about the legal aspects of these things. And you need to remember that these things are legal agreements that are going to impact your property in some way. You're either going to be giving up uses for the property down the road. It may limit how you can use it. If you put panels out there and you're grazing cattle or something out there, there's going to be no more cattle able to be grazed out there because they're going to rub against these things probably going to be a different form of livestock you have out there and you need to understand how these things are going to impact you. So kind of where are we headed with this? We're going to talk about some of the common terms available in these agreements that we typically see, what the typical agreement looks at, the length of the agreement, who needs to be involved in this process. It may just not be you. We may need to be talking to successors who are going to take over the farming operation, who are going to own the property at some point. I'm going to force you to talk to people you don't want to talk to probably at some point, but it's a holiday so we can have these conversations, right? We're going to talk about some common clauses found in these things and we'll talk about how state laws that can impact you, state and federal laws. So what are the common terms and what do landowners need to know? So the Short version is, if we're looking at wind, we're looking at solar, we're looking at any alternative energy agreement that converts something into electricity. We need the ability to access the land. And these agreements are one way we can get in to access the land and send it somewhere else, the electricity somewhere else. We usually do these with a series of easements that are coupled with an overlying lease. So these will be a series of agreements you enter into. So there may be a primary easement, another easement, and then an overall lease we're looking at as we go down the road. So the first thing it needs to be talked about is they're either going to be an easement allowing the development developer to travel across the property to do the test, to reach the sites, wherever these things are going to go. So there's going to have to be some ability for them to access it. So there will be a clause in there discussing access. There'll be a, something in there discussing construction. It's often tied to the access easement, so they go hand in hand. You can't go on the property to construct without an easement to get on the property. So then we tie in the easement to construct the panels and the supporting systems. We may need to run lines, we may need to put substations, and we may need to put something else in along with this. There will also be access for transmission lines usually in these things between you know the turbines, the panels, the substations, whatever it may be. There'll be a no obstruction clause in this. So if we're looking at solar, there's going to be a clause in there that tells you you can't build something that's going to impact the sunlight coming on the property in some way. Um, if we have these things to where they turn, that's more moving parts from the way I understand it to capture the sun, and it's more likely they're going to break down. But there is going to be some ability in there for the energy company to limit the ability to develop the property in certain ways. So you may not be able to put a barn up or another structure that you really need on the property. If we're looking specifically at wind um, and solar, there will be overhang provisions to allow these things to overhang the property in some way. Um, even if they're on the adjoining property, there may be some clause you have to enter into, especially with wind, not so much with solar, to allow an overhang in certain situations. Oh, I thought I heard a question. Um, there may be some clause in there involving noise that you should expect noise up into a certain decibel level within a specific radius. This is more with wind, not so much with solar, but could potentially be in there if we're using a, sol a wind agreement as a solar agreement, and these companies are not doing their homework at times. Um, and as we talked about originally, these are kind of multiple agreements rolled up into one. And it's typically going to be three agreements rolled up into one agreement. So there'll be an option period, then the easement, then the lease. And the industry's practice is to typically negotiate these all three at once. So you'll go in and sign three agreements. You won't just be signing one agreement. How long are these things going to run, the length of the agreement? The industry average, if we look at this, is 20 to 50 years. 
The majority of the solar panels have a 25 standard warrant, year warranty on them. That's about how long their life is. They start reducing in power um, output as they go along. So we're looking at potentially 25 years or longer. It's probably going to be longer because there's going to be a construction period that goes on. There's going to be an option period where they're going out and testing the property to make sure you're in the prime location for sunlight and what they need to do. The other question that comes up a lot is, what happens in between this 25-year period if technology changes? Technology is not going to change over the next 25 years, is it in any way, shape, or form? Okay, I'll... So, from what I understand from talking to companies is this is much easier to go out and change a panel than it is to go out and change wind turbine technology. So they're just going to walk out, put new panels on the property, and you're going to have the latest technology on your property. Yes? On the uh, option construction period, typically how long would they be? I think I've seen them from anywhere with the option period being two to three years and the construction period being up to five years. They vary here <laughs> in the length we've seen them. The other thing to look out for these in these things are there are automatic extensions in them. So we may come back here and have a lease that looks like a 25-year lease, a 30-year lease, but there may be option periods in it that extended another 10 or 15 years, and it may not be up to the landowner if this thing's extended. It will be up to the solar company to make a decision to extend it. Um, many times they may appear to be hidden to you, but they're easy to spot if you take it to legal representation to have them look it over and check for these things. Um, and one example, and I always like this example, is if you look at early wind leases in Oklahoma, they had combined contained automatic extension and option periods that extended the agreement 150 years. They're no longer doing that, but at the start of the industry, they were looking at 150 years. And as it's been pointed out, if you put this in perspective, if you think about this agreement being signed at the start of the Civil War, it would have expired six years ago. So these can have long periods of time if we're not paying attention. So we need to pay attention to how long they can potentially last out there. And with that length of time, the landowner really needs to be comfortable with how long it's going to run. How long are you comfortable with this lease running on your property? That's something you have to think about as to what's going to be useful for you. And if you're tying it up past your lifetime potentially and into your heir's lifetime, your children's lifetime, you probably need to talk to them about what their uses are for the property and how they're considering using it. So we're passing on a farm business. We may want to talk to the potential successors in the operation to determine what they want to do with the farm and not just make this decision by ourselves. So. Is everyone comfortable with the panels being on the property? Are you comfortable? Your children not? Are we going to have to come to some form of agreement? Dueling is illegal now, just to be clear. Um, and, you know, do they work with everyone's goals with the property? Are panels working with the goals on the property? Sorry, I thought I caught all the spots where it said turbines. And we may need to update estate plans, succession plans that include the lease so everyone's aware that the lease is happening and how it plays into farm succession plans. So as it points out, you've got to communicate with heirs to make sure they're aware of what's going on on the property. I'm sorry to tell you you have to communicate with more than just yourself or your spouse or someone and the attorney. You're probably going to have to bring your children in on this as well. Could they affect the sale of land? If the idea is eventually we're going to sell this piece of property, what does putting the lease on the property mean? Is it going to impact the selling price of the land? Um, are we going to have to get the energy company's approval? I've seen some leases in Western Maryland for solar that actually do require you to get the approval of the solar company before you can sell it, lease it, or do anything with it. I call that the horrible written lease. It was, there were other reasons why it was bad. It wasn't bad so much on that. There was one clause in it that said you could continue to use it for agriculture the way you had used it, and then the next clause said they couldn't lease it out. Well, the guy that owned it leased it out for farming. So how could he continue to do what he was supposed to do with the clause that said he couldn't lease it out? So there were some issues with that lease. The other thing to think about in this is how do you own your property? We go back to this communication things. They may be coming to you with the lease, but you may not be the sole owner of the property. 
You may have to talk to more people than just yourself to make this decision. So do you own it in fee simple absolute? If you're fee simple absolute owner, you're the sole owner of the property. You make all the decisions, so you don't have to talk to anybody. But if you hold it in a life estate where it's tied to either your life or someone else's life, you may, you're going to have to start talking to whoever takes that property over once that life event happens. If we're holding it in tenants in common where we have more than one owner, all the owners need to sign off on this. We have it with joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. We're going to have some form of joint tenancy in there where there's multiple owners. We have to talk to them. And if it's held in Maryland by tenancy by the entirety and it's marital property, you're going to have to talk to your spouse about this as well because they're also a co-owner of the property. So potentially, if it's like oil and gas leases that I've seen, the companies know who they need to be talking to, so they're going to be talking to you and everyone else they need to be talking to. But if they miss somebody, you might want to make them aware of that. Yes? Do we have to uh, notify neighbors? And can neighbors fight people on this issue? Um, you probably will not have to notify the neighbors. The company may, if that's how the zoning laws work. The company may have to make them aware before they put the panels on there, depending on what zoning law says. And legally, can they oppose the neighbors? Can they oppose the they can. They can make a stink. They may be able to go to zoning and planning and change some of this up to where it's no longer allowed at that point. Yes? It can't, well, at least for tax purposes, it may. If it no longer is zone, if it's taxed agricultural and you can no longer use it for ag. We're still trying to figure out if this will still remain ag property if you can't actually use it for ag, if it's changed its use. According to the tax people in the state, it's no longer ag if you can't use it for ag and they're going to start taxing you at a higher rate. I don't know on zoning yet. No, it can go back in at that point once the panels come off. So. Ownership's important because it tells us who needs to be involved in this. This is a, the next deal is a big deal on this side of the state, not so much in Western Maryland. Is it air property? How many people know what air property is? I figured you would know what <laughs> air property was. Air property, the idea is we've never really ever done an estate plan on this. We've just kind of passed it down generation to generation. And now it's owned by everybody who is ever related to the first people that owned it. So we may have 50 people we have to talk to. This is a bigger problem in Oklahoma where we have Native American land that has never actually gone through an estate plan issue. But there is communities here where this is an issue to where we may actually have to bring in a lot of people to start having this discussion and clean up some title issues because of that. Easements and encumbrances. What if you have an existing conservation easement on the property? Kind of goes back to your question, does it pull it out of ag use at that point? Um, you need to check the easement documents to see if this is allowed. Um, you may need written permission from the person holding the easement. If it's under Maryland Ag Land Preservation Foundation, whatever, MALF. I can't remember what MALF stands for off the top of my head. Oh, it's right there. Um, if you need, if it's under MALF, MALF now has written rules to allow limited solar development. I handed out something on that as well. Um, they allow it up to five acres or less than 5% of the east property. You can't divide fields up to make them unfarmable. You have to go through a process with MALF to get it approved. And if you're getting any rent money or royalty money that Sebastian talked about, you have to give a percentage of that back to MALF each year. So you're not going to be collecting everything. So if it's preserved through MALF at least, you're going to have to work with the state to get this approved. And they're going to approve solar, I think it's up until 2018 or 2019, and then after that the law sunsets out. So there's only a limited opportunity under MALF to do this. It may be extended, it may not be, depending on what the needs are in the future. Anything else, if it's preserved through a county land preservation, Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, any other group, you're going to have to check with the easement holder to make sure this fits the needs of the easements. 
and I kind of already talked about that slide, what if there are mortgages on the property? What if there are mortgages and easements? And yes, when I think about mortgages, for some reason I think about the Blues Brothers um, and paying the taxes off. Um, there may be easements on the property other than mouth, energy easements, pipeline easements, electrical easements, any type of easements. You need to check to make sure you're not restricted in signing the lease by that and everything's going to be clear where stuff's going to not impact those easements. If there is a mortgage on the property, you may want to start talking to the bank to make sure you can get away with signing this. So if the landowner has a property mortgage, the energy company may require the lender holding the mortgage to sign off that the lease takes priority over the mortgage so they at least can keep the property. If, some, if you don't make your payments and it's foreclosed upon, you know, they want to make sure they have some priority in all this process. Any questions up until that point? How common is it for lenders to sign those agreements? to subordinate their interests. I do not know. I was going to say, it's probably not going to be very common. It's in the agreements, but what is the recourse? And I just... I'm going to guess, like she said, not very common, but <laughs> something just to think about in all this. Yeah. So common clauses. And hopefully I got all these clean up. There may be a confidentiality clause in all of this, and we'll talk about what each one of these means. Duration clause we've kind of already talked about. Rent clause Sebastian talked a lot about. I'm not going to talk that much about it. There may be a royalty clause. There may be an assignment clause. There may be liability clauses. There's going to be tax clauses. It's going to be future use of land clauses. We're going to talk about all of these insurance clauses, termination clauses and remediation clauses. Um, the first thing to be aware of is most of these usually do contain a confidentiality clause that you need to be aware of. You're not supposed to talk about it, um, the terms of it with other parties other than typically the person providing you with legal counsel and your accountant. It may be a little broader than that at times to allow you more people to talk to. Um, it could be limited to the data collected during the option period. They may not want other companies to know what they're out doing, but more than likely it relates to the entire agreement. So you need to be aware of that and make sure that you know you at least follow that if you become a party to the lease. Duration. It's typically split into two periods. One component is a contract to the lease solar development rights for some fixed period of time, three to five years, and it excludes other companies from developing the property. This is typically when they're going to come out and look at, you know, is the land suitable for what they want to do? And then the second component will be the contract when everything actually goes up, it's developed, their access roads are created, whatever they need to do. It's typically 15, 20, maybe longer, and it allows the developer the right to turn back their their investment, actually ener energy will be developed, generated, and sold during this period of time. And again, we've already talked about this. Watch out for automatic extensions that may be in this. You may think you're signing a lease that's only 20 years, but it may say at their option they can extend it again for the length of the lease. So you may be actually extending it another 20 years. So we're looking at rent and royalty clauses. Sebastian has talked a lot about this already. Pay attention to how you're going to get paid. Talk to a financial person to help you understand what this may mean to you, what it's going to mean in the long term. Pay attention to definitions. It's probably not going to matter as much in solar, at least on the rent clauses. It may be it's more than likely going to be a per acre payment each year. But if we're looking at actual royalties generated off of it at some point, it may matter as to how they calculate that royalty payment. It's mattered in wind and it's mattered in oil and gas, it may matter down the road in solar. So we need to look at what can be included in that deduction before they make it, what's excluded, and when can all this happen. And how do we verify the accuracy? So if we're looking at a royalty, how do we verify that they're actually deducting what they should be and doing what they need to be doing? With solar, it's almost always going to be, you know, a it's going to be an upfront rental payment each year. Um, 
make sure you pay attention to what that's going to be, how it's going to be paid out. And Sebastian's already talked about that. Um, developer can retain the right to assign the lease during this period in the assignment clause or sublease it or convey it to another party. Um, so pay attention to who that's going to be. Um, you're probably not going to be able to add language in there that can be done with your consent or without your consent. You're probably not going to have that much power in this. It's probably going to be a lot like the mortgage clause. Um, you may look to see if you can do it, but the most you may want to do is just provide language in there that you're notified at some point along the way. That you're told, this is when, whenever this transaction happens, that all of a sudden I now know who is supposed to be sending me rent checks. Because if you get a rent check from a new company, you may not understand why you're getting it unless you're given notification of that assignment happening. Mm, I don't know about in Maryland on solar. It's happened in other areas in energy development, so it could happen here as well. Where somebody comes in and develops it and then hopes to sell it to Pepco or somebody else down the road. Provisions, so with liability insurance and that, um, there may be clauses in there requiring both parties to defend and hold the other harmless for claims arising on various land uses. So if it's your land use, you may have to hold them, defend them. If somebody sues and includes them as a party, and if it's their actions, they have to defend you if they're included as a party in the, the law, if you're included as a party in the lawsuit. So we're basically protecting the other party in that. And the example is almost always with a wind turbine, there's probably not going to be a solar turbine collapse destroying something. And there usually are setback requirements that will prevent this from happening and hitting neighboring property. But if something were to happen and cause damage, who gets this, how, who is suing who at that point? And who's included in the lawsuit? This is why potentially requiring insurance levels is a good thing. I think we talk about insurance clauses. There may be clauses in there that require them to carry insurance up to a certain value. There may be clauses in there requiring you to carry insurance of a certain value as well. Tax clauses. Potentially this will cause the value of the property to increase due to the facilities being built. We want to make sure the lease specifies who's responsible for the increases in taxes. I've seen some that have not said the developer is responsible for the increases in taxes. So we need to be aware of that. That goes back to the bad written lease in Western Maryland. That lease basically said landowner was responsible for any increase in tax value. The other thing is it could change the status of the tax liability change the status status of tax liability could change you may no longer be ag use assessed after this so you may need to check with SDAT to make sure you're still going to be ag use test tax accessible and if you're in an agreement with them you're not violating the agreement by moving out so you may have to pull land out of development on the property to keep you in ag use tax if you want to stay in ag use tax um, I don't know in Maryland, we haven't had that many developed yet, but in other states, almost always the increase in value is related back to the equipment and they just tax it as personal property to the developer and not to the real estate values to the person. Don't know if that's going to hold true in Maryland, but that's how it's happened in at least some other states. Future use of the land clauses. What rights are you willing to give up to develop this property? You may be giving up rights to develop it. You know, the language may specify what limits you can actually do with the property and what the developer can limit you to. Oh, I got ahead of myself. So it may actually limit the developer. So the developer may actually be able to limit, you know, how many turbines, how many panels, whatever they're going to put on the property. So they may tell you automatically they're only going to put so many on, so many substations, and how many transmission lines are going to run across the property. But the developer may also want to include language that develops what or limits what you can do at the property. So they may want to limit structure heights. Um, 
They want to make limit how close structures can be to these things. If their goal is to collect the sun, they don't want shading all of a sudden. If they put the panels in, they're not going to want them to be in the shade all of a sudden. So we're going to want to ensure that they maintain some ability to access the sun. So we're going to have to start looking at what exactly are we limiting ourselves to. Can we still use the property for what we want to use? So what happens when these things in? Now we're talking years down the road and no one remembers what we signed up for and how this was came, agreed upon. We want to start thinking about, you know, what language is going to define when this thing is terminated. Who can terminate it and how can it be terminated? More than likely it's only going to be able to be terminated by the solar company. Um, we want to clearly, you know, look at who can do this when it can be done and we may want to specify that it has to be given by agreement so we want the company to have to tell us when they're terminating it the other thing to think about is what about the remediation of the property so now you have all these solar panels out there do you want to have to figure out how to get them off your property how many people want to figure out how to get them off their property who do you want to take them off the property? Solar company. So you're going to want to make sure and look at the remediation clause. How is the property going to be remediated in the end? Is it going to be at the company's expense? Or is it going to be a bond that's held? The company puts up a bond that will potentially cover the requirements to return the land to the original state. We've seen everything from a requirement that the developer will take them off the property, but if the developer goes broke, is there going to be money to clean the property up? So we may want to look at a combination of a bond and something else to make sure the property is remediated before. One thing to consider is since no one will probably remember what the land actually looked like at that point, take photos and put them away so we know what the property looked like and have documentation so we can go back and relook at these things. Any questions up until that point? So federal and state laws. Are you participating in a USDA program? Or are you participating in a soil conservation district, state MDA program? Are you participating in some program besides conservation easements that's going to limit the ability to develop the property? Have you put some sort of equip project in on the property that may potentially limit your ability to develop it? Can you take that structure out at this point? Are you in CRP? If you're in CRP, you may not be able to do this. Is there a USDA loan program you're a part of that may limit this in some ways? I should also point in, are you a part of a state cost share program that you've signed an agreement to keep the structure good for so many years that this will impact similar to equip? State tort law. State tort law is potentially the biggest impact from state law currently. The other change would be county zoning and planning regulations on these as well, so we're not going to talk about those as much. But zoning and planning can play into this if the county decides to go into a moratorium. I think Talbot is in a moratorium on these for three years. Okay. Yeah, so zoning and planning may put a moratorium on this development. So this can also impact it. We did not include that in here, I don't think. I normally don't give this part of the presentation. Um, but we need to think about this. Is it going to end up being a nuisance potentially to our neighbors down the road? Um, we have private nuisances and public nuisances. One, you're interfering with another's use of their property. The private nuisance, public, you're interfering more with a public interest in the property, and it's more than likely... Um, define in state law what the public nuisance is going to be. We kind of put them up here um, for each. There's a lot more with wind. Solar has very few. So it's potentially noise and vibrations from the blade, shadow flicker, ice throws, blade shear, wind collapse, um, or turbine collapse, not wind collapse. So these are all potential nuisances that you could cause to your neighbors. Um, Reflecting sunlight is about the best nuisance theory I can find on these things. 
And that is just a theory stated by legal commentators. It's actually never been utilized by a court at any point. So there may be some impact from the sunlight now hitting your neighbor's house when it shouldn't have, and it didn't before, that you could potentially have a legal claim on. The other thing to point out is landowners in most states do not have the right to unobstructed views of the sunlight. So if your neighbor builds a structure and it impacts this, it may not violate, it's not going to violate the terms of your lease and the company may not have a lawsuit against them. Now the situation changes if the neighboring land is also leased by the solar company. So if that neighboring landowner is also tied to a similar solar lease, there may be limitations on their ability to develop to impact another leased property by that company. So wrap up and then we can do the evaluations and everyone can eat lunch. So the takeaway point with all of this is you really need to do your due diligence. You really need to talk, talk to people. You really need to talk to an attorney. You need to talk to an accountant to see how this is going to impact you. Like Columbo always did, he always had one more question, right? You always need to have one more question when you walk in. And you want to get it reviewed by a competent attorney. Um, we're working on a project or trying to get a project funded to where we would actually take attorneys who have actually negotiated these things and provide checklists and other things to attorneys looking at taking these on in their practice so they know what to be on the lookout for because nobody's really ever looked at these in the state before. So you really want to have somebody that's looked at one and knows what they're doing. And the other thing you need to remember is the first rule of contracts. The party that the party that drafted the contract took care of themselves. They really weren't looking out for you, so make sure you negotiate with these companies and see if you can get terms changed in it. The other thing to think about is you could potentially go together as a group, so if everybody in a common area is being looked at for this, you could pull together as a landowner association, solar association. Landowners in the West had a lot of um, they did this a lot with the wind energy companies and went in together. There's strength in numbers. Walmart's able to provide low cost because there's a lot of Walmart stores around the country. So you may be able to go in together and get better terms on the leases. And then going back to due diligence, just understand how it's going to impact you. Make sure you're comfortable with what the lease is going to do. If you understand it and you ask the right questions and you're probably not going to be Sherlock in this and understand everything you're doing at all times, but you need to go in and ask the questions so you understand what you're doing. Bring, you know, heirs in that will be impacted by this. Make sure they're asking questions and they can do it what they want to do as well because you're potentially tying this land up for years and you want to understand, understand how it's going to operate so you're not limiting yourself down the road. And those are some resources out there, and I gave you a copy of this. It's in my presentation. And that's it. Any questions? Uh-oh. I'm sorry. I, I, I did leave my rainbows and my unicorn at home, so forgive me. But <laughs> no, I meant the person behind you, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Find the sky question. Especially if you talked about joining together. I guess one of the things that frustrates me is uh, the single use aspect of solar, and it seems like in good place that you could raise cattle or raise some kind of crop under there. Is there any example out there where there's multi use, particularly, you know, some agronomical use in addition to the solar? The most I know that you can do with solar panels on the property from an ag perspective is run sheep on them after that. He has sheep, and they're going to raise up the structure right. for, for the sheep. They're very accommodating. That's good. Mm -hmm. But there's no national trend to do more because there's certainly a lot more potentially yeah. that could be done and allow farmers to increase their, their revenue off that land. It just seems like a waste. Nothing. No, no longer trends. Like I said, not just sheep, cattle, there's other. You know, you could multi-story uh, uh, raise uh, produce under there. I mean, there's a number of things that you could do. And it just seems like it's competing use with photosynthesis. So if you're going to yeah. capture the sun here, you're not going to capture it somewhere else. 
those plenty of weeds. So the grass could have grown if you got a choice solar or grass. But, but that, that's okay. I mean, just scientifically, the amount of photons that are reaching the ground is still a lot, even so, with those panels up. Yeah. And there may be ways to use it down the road that we just don't know about. But at this point, the only option I've heard is sheep. And it may be increased cost, too, in building the solar arrays. It's kind of like that one thing that pops into mind. Zoos in the rhino area have to put giant guards around the trees, otherwise the rhinos are ripping trees out. So let's put them out here. Cows are going to be strong here. And they can do damage to stuff. Professor Geyer. Uh, two questions. What, what do you hear as penalties on the confidentiality? And if the moratorium would last for a long period of time, would it become takings of my right to put solar panels out there? I'm still looking into when it becomes a takings. I'm still not sure. Could you repeat the question or it, the statement? The question was, I guess your question was, looking at the moratorium and the co confidentiality clause, when does it, how long is it that moratorium before it becomes a taking? Or did I miss one question in there? Uh, and the other question, what's the penalties? Are there any confidentiality clauses? There's usually nothing in the, just says shut up and I hope you're quiet and since this is being recorded, I'm not going to say much more. <laughs> I do not want to be on YouTube and get in trouble by the dean later. Yeah. Yes. As far as establishing a bond uh, dollar amount, is there for solar farms? There's is a general rule of thumb so much per acre. I have not seen one yet. If I can look into that. Yes. Uh, you following up on that question. Uh, for panels, are there? Is there anything in panels that would qualify as problematic things that don't, as far as toxicity or chemicals in it? Because if a developer goes bankrupt and you didn't put up enough fund, you're stuck with 38 solar panels. Uh, is, it, is it trash or is it something other than just trash in this landfill? The cost per panel is going to Probably not going to be something you can just take to the dump. So, I mean, it's going to be silicon. It's, it's, it's going to be silicon or maybe copper and other stuff you can't take in there, so you may have to start pulling stuff out. But the panels themselves may be able to go to the dump. I haven't checked on that. That's a good question. Well, just that heads up, the new perovskite crystals that are increasing efficiency that they're talking about coming on market very quick, those are embedded in a lead-based medium. So right now, the conditions right now are going to be very different than two to five years from now, so I think it's an excellent question. Yeah, that's a good question. So those can't go to the But then again, that company buys them back. They're there. Yeah. Somebody else had another question. Yes. Um, so I'm curious, have you seen any difference between net metering and the community um, solar approach? I have not. Sebastian, have you seen anything on that metering and community solar? <coughs> to distinguish the two? In terms of the, the benefit? The benefit and, and the legal side. Uh, I mean, the benefits are, the answer is no. Uh, yeah, we don't have a good comparison. Of the, okay. well, community solar, for those of you that don't know, this is the idea, the idea is that you have a group of homeowners and so on that will all invest uh, or participate in a, in a project, a solar project, uh, and they will pull resource for that. Uh, you know, instead of having solar panel on your house, you will find a location where everybody will invest or participate in one solar project. Um, and this is pretty new, and yeah, we don't have a good, okay, I understand. Thank you. Yes. Um, looking at how you can ensure that you're getting your proper payment per acre per year doesn't seem to be as much of a problem when you're using panels as it does with uh, wind power. But are some of these contracts for panels still tied to production? I haven't seen any that have been tied to production. They've almost always been per acre That's good, because per otherwise year. you're at the mercy of someone else telling you. 
how much they made off you, and that's really the Yeah, I was going to say, I think, so, yeah, it goes back to, to oil and gas leases, too. That was a huge problem always once right. production started, is how do you verify that I'm actually getting, and there's been a lot of lawsuits over companies not paying right. what they're supposed to owe. The only they know how much they made. Yeah. For royalty. Yes. It's something that, I mean, there's a revenue meter associated with every one of these projects. So uh, none, of the, none of the contracts give you the right to know the value coming off that uh, revenue meter? They usually do for the most part, I believe. I think you can always go ask, you just need to make sure it gives you the right to ask to look to see the metering and what the production was and how much came off, because you may not always check it all the time, or they may lock the box to keep you out. But that's sort of based on raw information, so electrons coming off the crop yeah. doesn't make a consideration what they might say is their cost and their profits, yeah. which is what it means <clears throat> well. So they can say, well, the prices drop that we we make nothing, so we can give you got to know there. Yeah, the oil and gas example would be there would always be costs associated to prepare the gas for market. You would have to clean it in some way, dry it, do something with it. So it depends on you have to kind of take them at their word sometimes or just be able to verify the records that they clean. These projects are a little bit easier because there's no cleaning, there's no processing really, it's just what was the production coming out. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to share that I, I found out and my husband while we were researching this that to maintain that property once the panel is on, one company, well this gentleman is, he's the farmer is maintaining it, he's mowing it, but they can contract someone, they will contract someone to maintain the property where the panels are. And they will pay that farmer, he's being paid to maintain it. That's good to know. So he has an option. Any other questions? Since yes. there also be a I'm finding, it, I'm a little bit in the industry, but I'm here on behalf of a friend of mine. And what seems to be a, a come lately situation is that there was a rush to install a lot of megawatts, some large arrays and whatnot. Then they started thinking about the O&M part. <laughs> All of a sudden, this is really starting to raise itself in that they didn't think out about maintenance issues and how to make sure that the panels stay clean. If they get dirty and dusty and crud from rain, is not always clean. <laughs> and it, you've got to go back and, and clean the dust under those panels. Now, that being said, I also know the industry is um, radically going after um, techniques to clean the panels. I mean, they literally have been robots that run up and down the panels to clean them. It'll be just, but uh, some of these installations didn't really make maintenance friendly. Um, when they did the installation, they literally packed the panels in too tight, and it gets going out and cleaning a panel on the side of a large array gets hard to get out. So, are there any way you can put clauses into it? I guess there's not really much you can do in that, is it? Legally. Uh, well, other than say they they are liable to maintain the production of the panel. Yeah, I guess that's it. Because usually, the if they're not maintaining it, it's on them. You're, as long as you get your rent check, <coughs> there's probably needs to be something in there to keep it clean. Yes, sir. Yeah, I work for a, a sort of development company on the Eastern Shore, and it's going to be in the company's best interest in yeah. keeping those panels maintained. Because if they're not producing as well as they could, you know, that is lost revenue for the company. Because if you guys are going to get a lease payment, you know, we're getting the money for how much we produce and how much we sell to the power company. So we have O&M providers that we use to maintain and we keep track of our production on a weekly basis. So, I mean, I, I for my company, am checking the production for all of our projects every week. And if there is a problem at that project, I will contact our own M provider and they will go out to the site and try to address the issue. Okay. <coughs> 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 
for damage to panels or something like that at one of these facilities. There is a hazardous materials incident kind of protocol that we have to yeah. follow. Speaking on behalf of the Chester County Fire Department, our funding is basically fundraisers. When we, we get a bit of supplement from the county, um, but that's also in the place of guarding on some of the volunteer fire service in the rural areas with respect to emergencies or hazmat incidents at a facility that may become damaged or fire. So, yeah, so that is on our plate as a volunteer fire service okay. as well. Any other uh, questions or comments?